Hi friends, I'm Steve Hall. Here on the Wild Side, we try to balance outdoor adventure with outdoor education. And that requires looking closely at endangered species, even though that's a subject some people would rather not discuss. On the other hand, when we hear about species that are simply in need of management, that opens an opportunity to talk about what's being done about it. All right. Let's do it. Yep, let's do it. You took left side, I'll take right. The young scientist inching her way along this creek bed beside her college professor used to play in the creek right beside her little brother. She was looking for salamanders then, and she's looking for them now. So I've always loved salamanders. I mean, when I was when I was a little kid, we had this little pond in our backyard, and my brother and I, we had this really old fiberglass canoe, and we'd drag the canoe out into the pond, and the pond was barely big enough for the canoe to turn around in. But that's what we did all summer, was we would go out and we'd catch turtles and frogs and whatever, and then we'd let them go, and the next day we'd come back and we'd do it again. Just playing outside as a child, set Nicole Witzel on a course that would lead her to what some may consider a divine destiny. The little amphibians she enjoyed catching as a kid keep a constant and very special place in her heart. They do. <laughs> I like them best. <laughs> That's a different species. So then I got to college and I didn't really know what I wanted to do. And so then I took an environmental sciences class and it was like, you know, this is what I want. This is so cool. Now with cutting edge technology available to her, the Tennessee State University graduate student is on the brink of a scientific breakthrough that could actually change the way streamside salamanders are counted. My study focuses on using eDNA or environmental DNA to pick up DNA in the water from these salamanders that they shed through their secretions or fecal matter or eggs or sperm when they're breeding. And it picks up that DNA in the water which makes it much easier to detect them because the adults can be so, so cryptic. They can hide up under rock ledges and you would never find them. I mean, you can't, you can't flip up bedrock. So if they're hiding under a rock ledge, um, you can't see them, but you can detect their DNA in the water. They can't hide their DNA. It's a little like a forensic scientist looking for DNA left behind at the scene of a crime. But in this case, Nicole is out in front searching for signs of DNA in spaces where salamanders are living. For my particular study, I have these 50 meter sections of stream and I take water samples at zero meters, 25 meters and 50 meters. And so the water moves downstream through that 50 meter stretch. And what I'm trying to do is figure out how much DNA these animals are producing in the zero to 50 meter stretch. In the process of collecting her water samples from 17 different sites in Middle Tennessee, Nicole and her professor, Dr. Bill Sutton are turning over every rock looking for larvae, eggs, and adults. There's some old eggs under this rock that have already hatched out. Then Nicole counts and weighs them and will attempt to correlate those numbers with the amount of DNA she finds. If I take DNA at the top and DNA at the bottom, then theoretically I can subtract the amount of DNA that I'm finding at the bottom from the amount of DNA at the top and find out how much is being produced in that 50 meter section. And so a lot of these approaches, you're initially starting out trying to develop the actual primers or the, the DNA sequences to do this process. And we're trying to build into this process, not only just finding the presence of the animal, but also trying to evaluate, can we use it a little bit further to maybe tell something more about population size? The immediate need for such a method to distinguish exactly where the salamanders are thriving has been brought on by the intensive increase in development in Nashville and Murfreesboro. The streamside salamanders are specifically found in seven counties surrounding the two cities. If we monitor these animals and keep an eye on their populations and suddenly we see a dip in the population, that means that something is terribly wrong and something needs to be fixed in that area. Our idea is if we can provide a quicker way to assess these streams and find out something about if the streamside salamanders are present, or if we understand things about like the population size, it can give us a quicker way to assess the quality of the stream before the development begins. State agencies are aware of the TSU study and watching with interest to see how Nicole's new theories will evolve. The beauty of Nicole's work is that her techniques and this technology for detecting free DNA will give us, uh, many of us, a much greater access to determining the presence of streamside salamanders in any stream anywhere with little or no disturbance of 
potentially occupied sites. The friction between environmentalists and developers is not a new age problem, but it is often exacerbated by incomplete documentation of a species, zoning law changes, and political opinions. When you're actually saying something is threatened or endangered, you're, you're assuming that you have a pretty good idea of population size. And sometimes it makes it seem like a species that's in need of management is not you know, as endangered or threatened as another species. But a lot of our species that are labeled in, deemed in need of management just don't have a lot of data we know about them. Potential conservation measures for the salamander often don't figure into the way that permits are crafted, the way that sites are built out. And it's, I think, uncomfortable for everyone to come in late in the process to say that we found something um, after the bulldozers already are on site. The field work, as intensive and time-consuming as it is, is just the beginning. The streamwater samples are brought back here to a couple of different labs on the campus of Tennessee State University where they are filtered and analyzed. You can see right there, there's a filter that will collect all of the DNA and pretty much whatever else is in the water. So as you can see, this water is pretty clean. It's filtering really fast. If the water's really dirty, it can take a really long time to filter. Some of the filters can get really clogged with debris and sediment. And so um, it's kind of an indication of how healthy the stream is because if there's a lot of sediment in the water, if there's a lot of mud hanging suspended in the water, it tends to be um, not as good of habitat for the salamanders. Recognizing her great responsibility, all of Nicole's equipment has been carefully decontaminated preserve the integrity of the DNA she will extract. Her research is a time-consuming and meticulous process. It's essential to the credibility and reliability it will require for her study to have the groundbreaking impact she's proposing. There's so many streams in this area of Tennessee, it's pretty much impossible to sample all of them traditionally. Doing what I was doing and turning over every rock in the stream, you can't do that in every single stream in Middle Tennessee. So this will give them a way to sample for the animals without ever having to see them in a really quick, easy way. These animals in general have been on this earth for a really, really long time. And so there's just the, the perspective of our, our, our need to actually conserve our biodiversity. Like Tennessee is very special for, for like having, you know, very high levels of stream biodiversity, including things like salamanders. And so it's our duty to protect these species to maintain our own kind of heritage across the state. Salamanders are known among scientists for the ecological services they provide as they turn over nutrients, prey on small insects, block carbon in leaves, and as a result, slow the release of carbon into the atmosphere. Nicole Witzel cared about them as a kid, and she still cares about them now. Because not enough people do, really. Yeah, sorry. I think that our society is too focused on the wrong things right now. And so, um, I don't know, I feel like I'm making a difference, or at least trying to, you know? Ooh. <laughs> I'm Annette Noel Hall on the Wild Side. You can search our website, wildsidetv.com, to learn more about the plight of streamside salamanders. Nicole and Dr. Sutton hope their findings will be published in a scientific journal. But more importantly, they want agencies like the Tennessee Department of Environment and Conservation and the Tennessee Wildlife Resources Agency to be able to use their work to help save contractors money and save the lives of streamside salamanders.